Hi, I'm Casey, pastor of Quest Church, a community of grace. Thanks for making time to watch or listen to this message. If it helps you in some way, let me encourage you to do two things. First, share it with somebody else. Second, if you don't already, consider becoming a financial partner with Quest. We are 100% supported with gifts by people like you. And now, here's today's message. Welcome again to Worship Today with Quest Church, a community of grace, and welcome to all of you who are part of our online worship community. My name is Casey. I'm the pastor. We're so glad that you're here. If you're new and you're in person, we'd invite you to stop out in the lobby after the service and just briefly fill out what we call a Connect card. They're on the little table next to the wall. Um, it's just a point of reference for us to make contact with you. We're not going to spam you or dog you or anything, uh, but we simply like to help you take your next steps of faith and get connected at Quest because our mission is to help people be wholehearted followers of Jesus Christ. If you're joining us online and you're new, we'd encourage you to reach out to us through one of two ways. You could email us at office at questwired.com, or you can text the word NEW to 217-328-1445. And today we're continuing a series called James Faith That Works, and in just a moment, we're going to be reading from James chapter 3. You know, every summer I wage war with ants, and, and thank God summer's uh, pretty much over and my battle is almost done, but this happens to me every year. Does this happen to anybody else? Every year on my kitchen counter, right around my sink, um, I have ants that just kind of, you know, trickle in. Doesn't matter how clean or dirty everything is. Uh, now, we're not talking about armies of ants. You know, they're just overwhelming me, you know, the flesh eaters like Indiana Jones or anything like that. But, but there's enough of them to bug me. Uh, yeah, there's a nice dad joke for you. Now, you know, your first instinct with a pest like an ant is, you know, just, just you know, squash those suckers. But then suddenly you're, you're, you're squashing here and there and there. And, and the problem is there's always more ants. Um, they, they just keep coming from the colony. Well, you, you get a little smarter and... Um, then you go out and you get one of those ant traps, right? There's just these little uh, discreet little boxes and, and the ants are going to crawl inside of there and they're never coming back out again, right? Well, again, the problem is there's always more ants coming from the colony where, where they just were. Well, I have learned, I have learned that there is something beyond the, the ant trap. Um, and this is really kind of a, a bait. And rather than kind of bringing them in and keeping them there forever, uh, these uh, traps, these bait traps, invite them in, and then they want them to leave again. You're like, why do they want them to leave? Because you see, I mean, there's no sugarcoating this. You're poisoning the ants, and then they carry that poison back to the source of your problem. They go back to the ant colony, and there at the ant colony, they, they poison all the ants, and now suddenly your, your ant problem is gone. You've gone to the source and treated it. And you know, we, we see wisdom in this in so many other areas of life, don't we? I mean, think about medicine. We figured out you, you don't treat the symptoms, you treat the disease, because the symptoms are, are, are kind of your body's responses to the disease. So if you want to get rid of the symptoms, you've got to go treat the sickness itself. Um, otherwise, you'll just always be taking medicines to combat runny nose and fatigue and, and headaches. Kill the bacteria, kill the virus at the source, and you have a cure. Well, listen, the same thing is true of our spiritual lives. Um, the Apostle James wants us to know something about treating the source. And he wrote a letter to early Christians um, full of practical wisdom about how to follow Jesus. And, and James wants faith that works. Faith 
that does something, faith that makes a positive change in the world. And as we're about to see, you can't have a faith that works, that ignores the words that we speak. And the treatment, the treatment for having a faith that works and a, and a mouth that works with a faith that works is a lot like treating a disease or tackling an ant problem. Well, let's take a look at what James says. We're reading in James chapter 3. If you're new to the Bible, great. We're so glad that you are new to the Bible. Uh, if you're in person, we actually have a physical Bible that you can pick up at the back of the room and take. Nobody will think you're stealing it. And James is a letter. It's in the very back of the Bible in a section called the New Testament, the Old and New Testament. And we're in James 3, and that's the, the 3 is the, uh, the big number, the chapter number there on the page. And then the verses are the tiny little numbers that follow. So we're in James 3, beginning with verse 1. Listen to what he says. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boast. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by God, by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by humankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs. Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Let's pray. Come, Holy Spirit. You are welcome with us today. Make us aware of Your presence. And Spirit, as you inspired James to write these words so many years ago. We pray that you would bring these words to life again today for us. Speak to us through these words and use them to give life to us. Eternal life, life from Jesus Christ, the Son. We pray in His name. Amen. So James opens this section, James chapter 3, with a warning about becoming a teacher. Now, lots of us might check out right now and say, Ah, it doesn't apply to me! I'm, I'm not a teacher. And, and even more of us might check out when we realize that James is not talking about teaching sixth grade English. Uh, he's talking about being a teacher or a guide for the way of Jesus, the Christian faith. Now you may go, oh, great, I'm, I'm never going to preach a sermon. I'm, I'm not standing up in front of anybody and ever trying to explain anything about the Bible. He is not talking to me. Well, hold on just a second. Don't check out just yet. Let, let's sit for just a minute with this. Let's ask, what is the deal with, with teaching and teachers? What's, what's the deal here? Well, he says, teachers 
you're going to be held to a higher standard. You'll be judged more strictly. And that's not all that surprising, is it? Um, we scrutinize people extra hard anytime um, they're in a position of influence or anytime they profess to be some kind of expert, a leader. Um, it's, it's the old insight from Spider-Man. With great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> and James says, look, all of us, teacher or not, we, we stumble in many ways. We, we mess up our words. We say dumb stuff. We say hurtful stuff. We just say stuff that we're like, oh, can I rewind that? Can I, can I have that back? We get tripped up because of stuff we say. Well, guess what? Professional talkers, professional talkers have it way worse because we talk more and it tends to be that more people hear us. Um, so we, we, we trip up and we're going to be held to a higher standard for that. Well, and, and, you know, James goes on to say something kind of kind of shocking. He says, anybody who can control their tongue, tongue tamers, they're, they're perfect. I'm like, perfect, James? Perfect? He's like, yeah, perfect. Now, he doesn't mean that you don't ever make a mistake or that you're flawless. Uh, he's, again, talking about perfection as maturity. And that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Kind of makes sense. Like when you, when you think about uh, people with verbal self-control, you go, you know, they, they've got a, lot of, they got a lot of maturity. And on the flip side of that, we see no filter as immature. So what is it that he's saying here about teachers? Let's circle back to this warning about teaching and teachers. Because I think there's something here for all of us. You see, you might never preach a sermon or teach a class about the Bible. But there is something here for you, even whether you're a Christian or not. You might not have a position, but you have a platform. You might not have a position, but you definitely have a platform. You have a, a reach, an audience. There are people in your orbit, in your network, that your words connect with. They hear what you say. They think about what you say. What you say registers with them and sticks with them. I mean, sometimes I'm shocked at this the strange little things that I remember that somebody said years ago. Sometimes profound things, sometimes uh, ridiculously dumb things, but with, regardless of your position, you have a platform. You are influencing somebody. And so right from the outset, James is saying, if you want a faith that works, you need to ask, what is my platform? Who are my words reaching? Who am I influencing by what I say? And think about all of the people that you come into contact with, the people that you see face-to-face -face in person. It's probably a lot more than you think. Think of all the people that you talk to or text with or email. Uh, whether you're sipping coffee in McDonald's with the old boys or you're gossiping uh, or about the latest school gossip at the cafeteria lunch table, you have a platform. Think of your social media reach. I mean, this is a whole new platform that literally everybody has. You don't have to own CNN or Fox News. Facebook and Instagram and TikTok uh, and Snapchat, that they've given you your own broadcasting network. How are you using that platform? How are you using that platform? How many people does it reach? Uh, you have a platform regardless of whether or not you have a position. And listen, think about this. Sometimes your platform grows because your position grows. And sometimes your position grows because your platform has grown. In other words, 
Sometimes people look at you and they realize you have influence, you have reach, your words impact people. They're like, we want to put this person, we want to put her into a position where we can formally make sure people are, are hearing what she has to say. Or sometimes because you've been elevated to a new job, a new role, now people are listening to you by virtue of your work. And, and, and James, by the way, James ends this opening section by warning us about the power of our platform and about being careful about not only how we use it, but about seeking a bigger platform. Now, I found a very interesting statistic recently. Generation Z, Gen Z, which includes people born roughly 1995 to 2010. One in four members of Gen Z would love nothing more than to be an influencer. They would love to have a huge platform. In other words, they would love to be somebody on social media um, who garners fame and, and wealth because they're on social media, they would love to influence what other people think and say and do and buy. Now think about that. That means, if that statistic is accurate, that about 9,000 students just up the road at the University of Illinois would love to be a social media influencer. And and what do we do with that when we want, when we, there's this drive to seek a platform to be heard? Well, James does not say don't pursue that. He says be careful about pursuing it and be careful how you use it. Uh, not only will the rest of us judge you and hold you to a higher standard once you profess to be an expert, but God will do so even more. So, so what is your reach? What is the impact of your words? What is your platform? Now in verse 3, James turns from platform to footprint. From platform to footprint. By footprint, we mean the effect of our words. He uses three examples to show us something powerful about our words. And just picture this. He mentions a horse bit, you know, the thing that goes in their mouth to kind of steer the horse, a ship rudder, and a spark of fire. What does a bit, a rudder, and a spark have in common? Well, all three are small things that influence or control bigger things. Small things with big impact. Riders can turn a, a big old, you know, horse with, with just this bit and bridle. Uh, sea captains can turn this gigantic ship with just that little wheel that's controlling a rudder down in the water. And how many huge forest fires have we seen in the last decade started by just a small spark? Words uh, seem like such a small thing. But James says they have a huge impact. Don't we know that they've got a lot of power? Think about it. Think about how uh, words have a negative impact. If somebody in a relationship says, it's over. You just turn somebody's world upside down. Hateful words, you know, typed out uh, online over and over again can drive somebody to depression or worse. People feel empowered to say, incredibly hurtful things online that they would never say in person. Our words can do a lot of damage, but we also know that words have a great capacity to do good as well. They can, they can change somebody's world. I love you. Can change somebody's world. I mean, you, even, even just hearing me say, I love you, that, that, that may even just right now, you feel like your emotional meter just like, boop, booped up just a little bit. Words can inspire us to do virtuous things. Winston Churchill tried to rally the English people to, against the Nazi invasion in World War II. And he, he, this is part of his speech. He said, we shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. Uh, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. And it rallied the nation. Virginia Woolf inspired generations of, of women. 
uh, to be able to use their abilities to flourish completely. And she wrote these words, lock up your libraries if you like. But there is no gate, no lock, no bolt that you can set upon the freedom of my mind. Or Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. rallied the soul of a nation, called to the United States to grant full civil rights to all people regardless of skin color. And in that famous speech he delivered at the, uh, in Washington, D.C., where he said, I have a dream. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Or we think of uh, Malala Yousafzai, who after surviving an attack on her life at age 15, became an even more rigorous education activist. And when she accepted the Nobel Peace the Peace Prize, she told the world, let us become the first generation that decides to be the last that sees empty classrooms, lost childhoods, wasted potentials. Let this be the last time that a girl or boy spends their childhood in a factory. Let this be the last time that a girl is forced into early child marriage. Let this end with us. Let's begin this ending together today, right here, right now. Let's begin this ending now. All these, these rousing words, we see the power of words. They can do harm, they can do great good. And whether or not, friends, you ever give a famous speech, whether you ever rally a nation to the defense or to some social cause, the reality is, as James says, you have a footprint. Your words are doing something with all those people that you reach. So not just what is your platform, who is it reaching, but how is it impacting them? What is the footprint? And we talk about our environmental footprint, how our decisions, our actions affect the ecology, the balance of the world around us. In our words, just like a small spark can start a raging fire that burns somebody's life down or sets them on fire to do what God made them to do. And so when we ask, what is my footprint? We got to ask, do my words bless or curse, build up or tear down? And by the way, did you notice something? Did you notice verse 6? Did you notice that James takes a surprising turn right here before taking us into his conclusion? He says the tongue corrupts the whole body. It sets the whole course of one's life on fire. What is he talking about? I I thought we were talking about how my words affect other people. Well, he says an untamed tongue doesn't just burn down other people's lives it will burn your life down too. You will will be the king of a wreckage heap. Because you see, the more uncontrolled words come out of us, the more uncontrolled we become. And we alienate everybody around us. It's a vicious cycle. What is your footprint? You know, hearing all this, I I, I ask myself, well, okay, so... (laughs) Words are powerful, so what can we do? What can we do to tame the tongue? Well, in the final part of his passage, James sounds hopeless, but has a word of hope. Listen, listen. He sounds hopeless. Listen again to verses 7 and 8. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed, but no human being can tame the tongue. We got dog trainers, lion tamers, no tongue tamers. And no human being can do this. We think, James, I came to church for good news. This sounds bad. This sounds helpless. Well, keep reading because it gets worse. Verse 9, he says, The same people praising God in church 
cuss people out an hour later. Oh, James. James, you are preaching now, but not, not to any of us, right? Not to any of us. That's not us. But he says, some people, some people praise God, and then they are tearing people down with their words. He says, how does that make sense? Don't you know that everybody that you meet, everybody was made in God's image and likeness, as it says in the book of Genesis. That we were made to mirror God, to reflect God, to represent God to the world, to one another. And no matter how distorted or damaged or how we are or how poorly we reflect God to one another, we, that image is there stamped on us. It cannot be removed. So when you say, oh God, you are amazing, and then you treat somebody like trash, this is that, 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 that's nonsensical. They cancel each other out. It's like trying to, it's like trying to get a pumpkin off an apple tree. It's, it's, it's like going into the ocean and filling up a cup of water and taking a sip and thinking somehow you got fresh water out of the salt doesn't work it shouldn't work in us either and you know when James says this when he says this do you know who he sounds like he sounds like somebody he was kind of close to he sounds like Jesus Jesus said in Matthew 7 every good tree bears good fruit but a bad tree bears bad fruit he also said in Matthew 12 34 the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. What's he mean? Well, James and Jesus are both urging us when we think about our words to ask, what is the root? What's underneath what I'm saying? What's at the root? What's the source of where these words are coming from? Why? Do I say the things I say? Where did this come from? And you know what? Sometimes I say some things that I'm deeply ashamed of, things I'm embarrassed about. And I would love nothing more than to say, that, that, that's not the real me. But the reality of it is, that is me. That comes out of me. That comes out of my heart. Now, sure, I might have been having a bad day. Maybe I was hurt, angry, lonely, or tired. But that was, my, that was part of my default position then. Now, I know that sounds like bad news on top of good news. Or excuse me, uh, uh, bad news on top of bad news. But I think there's hope in James's pessimism. First, when he said no human being can tame the tongue, not only was he right, but he was also urging us to look beyond ourselves for help. Second, by forcing us to look at the root, the source of our words, he's telling us that you change the fruit when you change the root. So to change the fruit, change the root. Go to the source. Find out what's going on in there. But again, you go, well, I can't do this. Like, yeah, you're going to have to have help from the outside. Something from the outside is going to have to get inside and change you from the inside out. And guess what? We know it does that. It's the gospel. It's Jesus Christ and the power of His Holy Spirit. Remember, friends, remember. Remember this good news. Remember that God made us to be with Him. But we rebel against God's love and our sin separates us from God. And there is nothing we can do. Nothing we can do to fix it. Nothing we can do to take away our sins. Nothing we can do to treat the source on our own. We're powerless. But the good news is is that Jesus Christ, paying the price for our sins, died and rose again. And everyone who trusts Him has eternal life. That life starts today and goes forever. And guess what? 
that life is what changes us from the inside out. When you and I trust Jesus Christ, He starts changing us from the inside out. See, Jesus treats the source to tame the tongue. Treat the source to tame the tongue. I can't do that on my own. You can't either, but Jesus Christ will do it if you let Him, if you trust Him. His Holy Spirit comes in and purifies the spring of our heart where the words come from. And the Spirit, as as we are living the Christian life, as we are worshiping, as we are reading Scripture, as we are praying, the Scripture will shine a light on our words, will shine a light on our hearts, and you'll say something and the Spirit will check you and you'll and, and say, hey, 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 that's, that's, that's not it, man. That's not the way to do this. That's not the thing to say. And, and the Spirit will say, do you know why you said that? And will expose something in your heart and expose the root and say, let's work on this. Let's change it together. And guys, that is God's grace. Because you see, when you trust Jesus Christ, God's grace not only provides forgiveness for those times when we fail, but it provides grace to heal us and to change us. Treat the source to tame the tongue. And that's what Jesus Christ will do. As we pray today, I encourage you to open up your heart to Christ, to ask Him to expose your words, to expose your heart, and to change you from the inside out. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, thank You for these sobering words from James. We want faith that works. And so we now know That means paying close attention to what we say. But we are so powerless to do anything about changing ourselves, but you, Jesus, have the power. And so we pray that you would shine a light on our hearts today. Help us to see our platform, our footprint, and expose the root of our words. And Jesus, we invite you to fill us with your Holy Spirit and to change us from the inside out so that our words bless and build up. We pray in your name. Amen.